I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. This is episode number 69, and you can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 069. Carry tip for this episode is carry at least one reload. No, I don't mean reloaded ammunition. I have, for this episode, we're, we do have a guest on the show, and my after interview discussion with him, we actually discussed a little bit about reloading. So in the future, I may do an episode on some reloading. However, I want, that's going to be a, that's going to be something I want to approach with a lot of care and caution. So here's what, here's the thing. The reason you should always carry at least one reload if you're carrying a revolver, carry a carry a speed loader. If you got a semi-auto, carry an extra magazine. By having a full reload, that means that if you have bad ammunition or you have a bad magazine in a semi-auto, you're not necessarily out of the fight. If you're dealing with multiple attackers, maybe you will use that ammo, maybe not. But, you know, when you go to a lot of gun schools, they, uh, they almost all preach one is none, two is one. Carry that reload. After all, if you if you're like most people, you carry a semi-auto, and the vast majority of failures in semi-auto handguns is magazine related. Go figure. As I said, we got a guest for this episode. I will get to that interview in just a moment, and just for just for grins, I'm going to go ahead and run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show, and then I'll come back and hit on some listener feedback, and then we will well we'll go from there. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. We have a young lady who emailed in that she's talking, to, she's talking about, uh, she was told that open carry goes into effect the 1st of September. She was under the impression that it goes into effect the 1st of the year. Well, I'll make it easy. On the website, on the very front page, there's a countdown clock. It's counting down to when open carry goes into effect on January 1st. For those who don't know what's going on there, let me say, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Don't open carry a modern handgun before January 1st. If you openly carry... There's a good chance you'll be noticed, you'll be arrested, and you'll be charged. You don't want to go through that. Now, we have another email that I want to respond to, and he, we'll go with his first name, Michael. Michael wrote in wanting to know if, uh, if the podcast actually goes anywhere besides the, he uses the word studio. It's kind of a small bedroom that's been turned into a reloading room and podcast station. And by station, it's a small table, like a workstation. But no, the podcast really doesn't travel. I occasionally will go out and talk to people elsewhere, like in Lubbock. But usually that's done because I just happen to be in Lubbock and or I happen to be at this location or that location. But no, there's no plans to take the podcast anywhere. Hmm. Wow, that email just barely... I just had an email uh, drop into the, <laughs> let me read this one real quick. It just barely hit, uh, landed in the inbox. Okay. Mike and Clarissa. Okay. Mike and Clarissa emailed wanting to know if open carry is going to be limited on caliber. Well, there's nothing in the law that says you have to carry a specific caliber or something of a minimum size. I assume that's what she means or they mean. The email address is, M I K E and C L A R I S S A Clarissa, Mike and Clarissa. I'm not going to give you the domain because well, and they don't actually give their name or anything like that. So I don't know if it was he or she, but yeah, that's kind of a hard one to, it's hard to read that one. I don't really know why it was wrote the way it was, but Hey, let me go ahead. I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to, how to follow the show on social media and after that we'll come back to our interview the gun rights in texas podcast has a social media presence you can like it on facebook you can follow it on twitter 
You can circle it on Google Plus and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. For this episode, we've got a guest with us today. Charles Cotton has once again been nice enough to join us and we're going to discuss two issues with him. And with that said, let me welcome Charles on board and I think there's something he he needs to get out of the way before we actually get into the meat of the subject. Charles, if you want, go ahead and say what you need to say. Uh, good morning, Aaron. I appreciate you having me on again. And yeah, I guess we can uh, we can call this the lawyer small print at the bottom of the TV ads all the time. And <laughs> I just need to note that uh, while I'm on the board of directors of the National Rifle Association, uh, any comments that I make here are, are my own or representative possibly of another organization, but not the NRA. Uh, no board member can speak on behalf of the NRA. The only time we can take any action as representatives is when we are assembled as a uh, as a board of directors. And with that, uh, let's visit uh, about some very important issues coming up. All right. Well, uh, you recently announced a new project you started, the CHL's United Movement. If you would, would you tell us a little bit about what is CHL's United? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love the opportunity to do that because we really do need to get the word out. CHL's United is not a standalone organization. It's a movement. Uh, it, it's it's Oh, I guess I could liken it to the women's suffrage movement when women were were gather, you know gathering together trying to get the right to vote, and it wasn't a particular organization. Well, so it is here. Um, the whole purpose behind CHLs United is to to create a movement with a single issue, a single goal, and that is to remove the restrictions currently placed on Texas concealed handgun licensees as to where they cannot carry their self-defense handguns. That's the sole purpose of it. Uh, we've got something on the order of you know, over 850,000 concealed handgun licensees, or as you know, what we just referred to uh, by the acronym CHL. Uh, we have over 850,000, uh, likely to have over a million within the next few months if the current rate uh, uh, of new licensees continues. And if we can focus that number of people, that number of voters, on a single issue pointing out our excellent 20-year track record, then it's far more likely to be able to remove these restrictions uh, in 2017. There have been bills passed, uh, I'm sorry, bills filed in 2013 and 2015 that went absolutely nowhere. It was House Bill 3218 in 2013 and House Bill 308 in 2015. So we need a focused effort to pass that type legislation. All right. Well, with that out of the way, uh, who who all can join? I mean, does somebody have to be a CHL or can they join if they're considering it? Or maybe they just want to show support for the movement. Who all can join? Anyone can join. Uh, I suspect that the majority of, of folks that do join the movement will be CHL holders, but as you point out, uh, it can be anyone. It can be people who are considering it in the future. It can be people that really don't have a desire or don't feel a need to get a CHL, but they just want to further Second Amendment rights. I think the majority will be CHL holders, but it's certainly not limited that way. Everyone is welcome to join. Okay. And what does it cost to join? It, there's a ten dollar fee for joining the movement, and the the reason uh, for the fee, well, it's actually twofold. One is is legal, which I'm not going to get into for you know various reasons, but the other reason is the goal is to get the word out. It's it's great to have five hundred thousand, a million people in your movement, but if no one knows that, it doesn't have a whole lot of impact. And yes. You could ask the, the, the those in the movement to uh, send a, a, a text, um, an email, a fax to Senator you know, John Doe or all senators or something like that. But you're not going to make friends by, by flooding them with a half million to a, million to a million emails or faxes. That's not, that's not the way you let your size be known. And one way to do that is through uh, effective advertising. TV and radio spots at prime time, not at three o'clock in the morning when rates are cheap and you know there's two people in the city of Houston watching TV. <laughs> uh, that's what that's what uh, the that's what the the uh, fee 
for joining will be used for along with other operational expenses, uh, traveling around the state and that kind of stuff, if in fact that makes sense. Um, I would like to do it. I would love to, to speak to a lot of different uh, groups and people around the state. But when you're when you're using funds towards the legislative goals, it's not a vacation. You have to spend it in, in a way that makes the most sense uh, in terms of getting your message out. Well, we can uh, we can definitely agree on that with uh, with everything everybody's been doing lately. You already mentioned what the goals of CHL United were, and how do the how does or actually the goal of CHL United? Let me let me correct that because I mean really it's one goal. <laughs> so how does how does that goal affect people that have a concealed handgun license, and how does it affect those who really don't have that license as well? Well, you pointed out something that a lot of folks miss uh, in in the discussion here, and and that is the fact that it impacts people who do not have a CHL. Uh, obviously, not in a direct fashion, but it affects them. And and the reason these restricted areas need to be removed, need to be repealed, is because number one, there's no logical reason to require that the most law-abiding segment of Texans disarm to go into an area where other Texans are allowed to carry their self-defense weapons. The the 20-year track record that we have now is just astonishing. It is so good. In fact, I've been tracking uh, the stats since 2002, and when I had uh, a, an intern in our law firm do them the first time, well, the first few years, I thought, this is wrong. This can't be right. Uh, it's just too good. Go back and do it again. So after you know, I sent it back twice, she finally said, kind of laughed and said, if you don't believe it, do it yourself. And it was that good. And it's only gotten better. For instance, it's gone up from uh, the, the, the uh, comparison has gone up from CHLs being seven times less likely to commit a crime than the general public to as high as 17 times as likely. Uh, 17 times less likely, I'm sorry, to commit a crime than the general public. Those numbers are astonishing. Law enforcement in Texas has an excellent record, but it's not near as good as CHLs. It's something on the order of seven times less likely to commit a crime. And those are significant because the question shouldn't be, why would you need a gun in fill in the blank? The question should be, is there a compelling reason not to allow law-abiding Texans to carry self-defense handguns in, once again, fill in the blank. And that's the, so the question, the wrong question is being asked. That's the important factor, is that we, we, we don't have artificial uh, restrictions. The reason we don't want people disarmed is it's not just in the location. And the example that I like to give, because I'm a football fan, is that if I go to a Houston Texans football game, at NRG Stadium, I cannot imagine a scenario where I would really need to use my handgun in self-defense. Could it happen? Yes. But I can't think of a realistic scenario where that would occur. But in the parking lot of now NRG Stadium used to be the Astrodome, the Astrodome Complex, Astro Hall. They all changed the names and to a certain extent the buildings. But in that whole parking lot area, since 1965, when the Astrodome, Astrodome was originally built, there have been multiple assaults, robberies, rapes, and even some murders there. So it's not that, that any of us would likely to need uh, our handgun at a football game or a basketball game or a high school football game. It's in the parking lot to and from our cars or wherever we may be going. So that's another reason that this needs to be repealed. And the indirect benefit is... Every time a CHL disarms and leave, has to leave a gun in the car, especially if they decide to lock it in the trunk, which we would think would be a little safer place, because more, you know, most automobile vehicle uh, burglaries, they break into the cabin area, but not a trunk if you have a trunk. Of course, if you have an SUV or a pickup, that's not the case. But every time you disarm, it's the, the potential that someone will see you doing that, and then will burglarize that car and get a gun. And anyone that would do that certainly is not an honest, law-abiding citizen. It's a criminal, a criminal who could use that gun for some kind of uh, criminal activity against another innocent person. So that's how I say it. In, uh, that you were exactly right, that it impacts people who do not even have 
the CHL in that it per potentially arms a criminal. So essentially, someone that does not have a CHL will gain protection from this because someone with a CHL does not have to disarm and placing that gun in a position where it could be stolen and used against the unarmed individual. Sure. I mean, you know, the, 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 if we look at it in, in the broadest in the broadest scope, a non-CHL, okay, here's a pistol out here. Who would you rather have? A criminal who burglarizes a car or the CHL holder who's 17 times less likely to commit a crime? I mean, it's to me, it's it's uh, you know it's a rhetorical question. Of course. And uh, I can't help but laugh when some folks uh, uh, try to argue that there are sensitive areas, and they like that phrase because it was mentioned in Heller. There are sensitive areas where we just need to keep all guns out. Yet we don't keep all guns out. Uh, another another misconception is that the areas that are off limits to CHL holders right now are not off limits to peace officers, and most people don't have a problem with peace officers carrying those locations. Me either. I don't have a problem with that at all. What they don't realize, though, it's not number one the difference in the in the uh, conviction rates. Okay, mm -hmm. but let's take the, let's take the statistics out of it. What a lot of folks don't realize is that it's not only police officers, men and women who wear the badge, it can carry in those locations. It's a number of other people. It's judges. It's certain prosecuting attorneys, uh, probation officers, railroad detectives. If you were to look in the Code of Criminal Procedure, and I, the particular section escapes me at this point, and look to see how many flavors, if you will, of peace officers we have, or people that are defined as peace officers. It's far more than police officers, deputy sheriffs, and constables, like most people think. There's something on the order of 22 different categories of people who are technically police officers. Investigators for the state board of uh, pharmacy examiners, for, for example, uh, are peace officers. And all of these people can carry in those locations but only if they also have a concealed handgun license. So it's not even their job, uh, their job title or their job uh, duties that authorize the carrying of the handgun. It is the combination of their job title and the fact that they have a CHL. So I think when you consider all the evidence, it's obvious that we really we have a unicorn fence up here, okay? We don't have any bad guys that we're keeping out. We're keeping out the most law-abiding segment of Texans. Now, CHL, CHL's United does not intend to do away with the uh, 30-06 or anything like that either. It's just to get these areas that are statutorily off limits, correct? Absolutely correct. Private property is a completely different issue, and we will not do anything to 30-06 or 30-07. All righty. Well, is there anything else you want to say about CHL's United before we move on to talking about Senate Bill 273? Only that this effort, uh, CHL's United has the, has the opportunity to bring the most political power ever seen in Texas to Austin in 2017. We can be, we can be the most powerful political factor in the entire legislative session on this one single issue, but that will happen only if we get a massive response to our recruiting effort. If it winds up being several thousand or even a few few tens of thousands, okay, we'll do what we can, but it won't be the 800-pound political gorilla unless we have a massive response, and that's, that's another reason that uh, the fee is, is so low is that we don't want money to be a, a stumbling block, but we do need to advertise and we need to buy expensive ad space. So uh, if anyone who cares about this issue, they need to, they need to join the, the movement. All righty. Well, uh, the link for it is chlsunited.com, am I correct? That's correct. Uh, it's actually a page on the Texas Firearms Coalition website, but uh, we do have the, the uh, domain name chlsunited.com uh, uh, registered, and people can punch that in. It'll take them to the right spot. They can get more information about the program, about, excuse me, the program, about the movement, and there's a link there to join. All righty. I was trying to sign up while, uh, while you were talking about it, and my browser just crashed horribly bad, and... <laughs> Just looking at it, it looks like I have a plug-in that 
I I haven't used in years, and that plug-in decided to go on the fritz right now. So, <laughs> uh, well, you you can certainly get there later, Aaron, yeah. and, and we hope to see you uh, on our rolls. Well, my plan was I was going to say, yeah, and it's so easy. I just did it, but when I I was actually about well, I had click submit. It was starting to it was starting to send information on my name and all go to where you know go to the page where you enter your information to make the contribution. And at that point, uh, I had this uh, plugin pop up a message and it crashed. And basically, it was uh, the plugin had an exception error. So. <laughs> it seems like it's pretty easy. Let me say that. It it is. It really is. Well, uh, moving on to Senate Bill 273, this was the bill where basically it's caused a lot of it's caused a lot of tension with local governments. So, if you would explain to explain to the audience what Senate Bill 273 is and uh how why it's important. Okay, Aaron. Uh let let me give folks a very short history lesson uh, as to as to how we got to the point where 273 was was even necessary. Uh, when when the first concealed handgun statute passed in 1995, it was Senate Bill 60. Uh, we had to include a lot of requirements and restrictions, quite frankly, that that we knew at the time were unnecessary, but we had to do it to get the bills passed. Uh, it was considered a radical concept at the time. There weren't very many states that that actually uh, had a, a law to allow the issuance of a carry license, and many of those who had the laws on the books never did it. So it was it was considered uh, a pretty <laughs> radical step. And those of us who had worked on it for so many years couldn't help but you know kind of shake our head and say, "Oh, you're worried about the boogeyman," but but whatever. The political facts were we had to take restrictions, including a number of restrictions uh, on where you could carry. There, as, as you mentioned earlier, private property rights are, are and always should be an issue in Texas. So private property owners were allowed to post any no-gun signs on their property to keep uh, armed CHL holders from entering with their handgun. This became a problem even before Senate Bill uh, 60 passed, and certainly it exploded after uh, then-Governor Bush signed Senate Bill 60, and it went into effect uh, September 1, 1995. Now, there was a kind of unique provision in there. It gave DPS time to get set up, so any licenses issued prior to January 1, 2000, I'm sorry, January 1, 1996, were not effective until that day. But you know, it technically went into into effect September 1, 95. The media, and at that time in cahoots with Sarah Brady's organization, were engaged in a massive scare campaign, and we started seeing a lot of really small, clear decals, just kind of generic, no-gun deca uh, decals. They were typically two by two inches or three by three inches, and it just had a Beretta 92F in it with an international slash symbol. And they were popping up on mom and pop shops all over the state. Now, not in the big office buildings, because this is going to sound pompous, and I don't mean it that way, but I had a chance to speak to BOMA, the Building Owners and Management Association, when they met in Houston in 95. And we talked about a lot of things, and, and their ultimate recommendation, BOMA's recommendation was, we are not going to take a position on this, and we're not going to recommend that um, that our members post any kind of no-gun signs. Now, that letter is viewed by gun owners as the famous BOMA letter and Sarah Brady and the anti-gunners as the infamous BOMA letter of 95. <laughs> but nevertheless, that that was the impact it had. But it didn't help us with, with um, small mom-and-pop shops. So a lot of us were saying before the 95 session was over, we've got to fix this in 96 because this, the scare tactics that the media and, and Sarah Brady are, are using, unfortunately, are turning out to be somewhat effective. And it's going to kill the program, not because uh, the legislature would have repealed it in 97, but because people wouldn't have bothered to get a license if most of the places we go throughout the day wouldn't let us carry there anyway. So the plans were already laid for creation of Texas Penal Code 30.06 in 1997, and that's when it was passed. It was part of 
uh, House Bill 2909. We didn't address governmental property because, quite frankly, I guess we were somewhat naive and expected the um, local officials, elected officials, and agency heads to be intellectually honest and not abuse it. Unfortunately, we were wrong because what we saw was governmental officials were posting 30 out 6 no trespassing signs on government property that was not listed as, as being off limits by the legislature. And while this was not technically unlawful and certainly wasn't a criminal act, it was intellectually dishonest. I mean, when the legislature says, okay, these are the locations, government property, where you cannot carry, it's implied that the legislature doesn't intend local officials to to expand those off-limits areas. I mean, Texas, since 1987, has had a preemption statute that keeps cities, uh, and, and later we added counties, from re- regulating firearms. So I, I think it was not a stretch to expect you know, intellectual honesty there. Well, when we saw that was going to be a problem, it was 2003, we passed uh, Senate Bill 501 that added subpart E, ECHO, to 30.06, and it prevented, uh, it made unenforceable 30-06 signs posted on governmental, uh, well, let me back up. It made any 30-06 sign or oral notice given under 30-06 ineffective, unenforceable, if it was posted or given on government property on, that was uh, either owned by the government or leased by the government. And we thought, okay, that does it. That makes it real clear. We don't want you doing this. Once again, we were, I guess, naive, politically naive, because we saw cities and counties and governmental agencies continuing to, not only did they not pull down the unenforceable signs, they added more. And there were reports, anecdotal reports, do not know how accurate or inaccurate they are, but there were anecdotal reports from CHL holders that some cities were instructing their police departments to make arrests for criminal trespass under 30.06, and knowing that they were not uh, enforceable and that the CHL holder was going to win, either because the DA wouldn't accept the charges, or if the DA accepted the charges, the judge would throw it out, or that they would win at trial. But the, the, the motivation for doing that was pure, pure coercion. It was intimidation. So that kind of gives you the setting for why a bill like 273 was so important, is so important. Um, it was filed in um, 2013. I believe at that time it was House Bill 308, but I may be wrong on it. It may have been 508. And it passed the House, passed the Senate, but the Senate put on an amendment House wouldn't go along with that amendment. They went to a conference committee. The amendment not only was not pulled off, it was made even more egregious, and the House revolted and killed the bill. There was not enough time to go back to conference and try to strip it out. So that set the scene for 2015, and 2015 saw the passage of Senate Bill 273. Well, uh, Senate Bill 273 for me is a good first step. Simply, Simply put, we know we both know it doesn't completely fix the problem, but it sets the stage for future expansion. And part of that is who actually starts the complaints regarding these improper postings, and who actually takes the action against the cities and counties on them. And, and let me let me start off my answer by saying your evaluation of this bill is spot on, uh, rep- uh, Representative. I'm sorry about the, about the demo to there, Senator <laughs> Campbell, Donna Campbell, uh, who was. In her second, in her first term, but her second session, uh, led the charge on this. And I mean, I cannot say enough good things about Senator Campbell in terms of her respect for the Second Amendment and her support, her her steadfast support of Texas gun owners. I mean, it is amazing that a freshman would take off into the bills that she did last session, and that she would, you know jump right into the fray with 273 this time. So I've really got to offer my heartfelt respect and thanks to her. Um, 273, in essence, creates a civil fine for any governmental agency or entity that posts a an unenforceable 30-06 sign that gives oral notice under 30-06, or that it posts any sign, even if it's not truly a, a 
uh, what we call a compliant 30-06 sign, any sign whatsoever that mentions CHL holders and guns that gets a no guns acro message across. And that fine is either $1,000 a day per sign or $1,500 a day per sign for the first, the first offense. If the uh, court holds them liable for that, all fines thereafter are $10,000 a day or $10,500 per day per sign. So it gets astronomical, even at the $1,000 a day fine. Um, if, if they were to do that and then the AG files suit and the suit takes two years to get through the entire process, both the trial and the appeal and all that, that works out to $730,000 for every single sign that is unlawfully posted. Uh, plus, the AG's office gets to uh, collect attorney fees and all other uh, cost of litigation. So it's, it's now a major, major issue. That's why we're seeing, well, we've even seen a request for uh, an AG opinion uh, issued by some DAs because they're concerned, allegedly concerned about whether where they can post signs in courthouses. And that's, you know, we can get into that discussion later if you like. But that kind of sets the stage. In order to, to uh, file a complaint, and at this point, let me say, only the AG's office has the authority to file suit. I would like to have seen what we call a private cause of action be an option, and I fully expect uh, to to see that offered uh, as an amendment to the statute in 2017. But right now, let's say you go to your city hall or uh, city library or any other location that's not statutorily off limits, and you see a 30 out 6 sign. In order to file suit, in order to... to complain, you, you need to send a notice to the head of the city or state agency or county agency, the governmental agency, saying, look, you got a 30 out 6 sign on City Hall, not supposed to be there, you got three days to take it down. The statute is silent on what kind of proof you need. My recommendation to folks, and, I'm, and through the Texas Firearms Coalition, I am going to be publicizing, making forms available an affidavit, my recommendation is take a picture of the sign on a phone, on, on a camera that will date it, and then sign an affidavit that uh, will be proving it up, as we lawyers say. And then send that, uh, you don't have to send all that to the, to the agency, you just send a, a notice. Three days later, if the sign is still there, uh, send the, the photograph and the uh, affidavit to the AG's office. Again, that's not required. That's just my recommendation because the statute does say anyone filing a complaint with the AG must show evidence of a violation. A photograph with an affidavit is, is perfect for that to, to, to meet the requirement of, of uh, that provision in the statute. The AG then must investigate it. If they find that, yes, indeedy, there is uh, an unlawful sign there, they have to notify the same person and give them 15 days to cure, as lawyers say, uh, and that is to remove to remove the sign. Uh, if they do not, then the AG's office may, but is not required to file suit either in Travis County or in the county, <coughs> excuse me, in which the unlawful sign is posted, and it can be filed in district court. Uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, I would like to have seen the bill remain as it was initially, and that is uh, it would have required the AG's office to file suit rather than make it you know, permissible. But I understand why the AG's office balked at that, because they know there's a big problem with unenforceable signs out there. What they don't know is how responsive uh, governments are going to be to this new law. And it was potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of lawsuits they'd be looking at filing, and they simply don't have the staff to do that. That's why I think in 2017 we need to add a private cause of action. I tried to have that done this time, but we were far enough along in, in the session in, in the session that that would have risked, because of the calendar, would have risked passage of the, of the bill uh, in total. So it wasn't it wasn't uh, worth the risk. We needed to get something on the books. And as far as who people need to contact, uh, if it's like a city, if it's a city uh, 
location, the city manager or whoever the city has as being the executive individual that handles the city operations, correct? Absolutely correct. Uh, if it's a large city like Houston, Dallas, um, I don't know about San Antonio, they have a mayor, send it to the mayor's office. The mayor's not going to read it. It's going to be one of her, his or her minions that, that reads it, but send it to the office. And by the way, send it certified mail return receipt requested. Don't email it. Don't fax it. Fax is not bad, to be honest with you. That's okay. Uh, but either fax or certified mail return receipt requested. The statute is silent on how you have to give notice. It has to be written, but it, it's silent on the delivery method. So uh, I would su- I would suggest one of those two formats simply because you'll have proof that it was done if and when they come back later and say, we never got notice. If You've got to know what the city structure is, though, city government structure. Um, if it's a smaller town, and even some towns of a size that would surprise you, they have a weak mayor and council, and they have a city manager. If there is a city manager, then I would suggest sending it to the city manager. Let's say you see a no-gun signs on a park building. Uh, let's say it's the Houston Parks Department building. I would still send the message, uh, the uh, notice to the mayor of the city of Houston, not to the parks department uh, manager or official of whatever title they have. Send it to the top person in charge, and that's the best way to do it. Now, if you're dealing with an agency, uh, I'm not going to pick on DPS because DPS is great with CHL, but let's say, there's a, let's say there's a licensing agency for something else or a county extension office, and um, they've got a sign out there. Uh, well, okay, here is an example. 36 signs are posted on a lot of, on some, Harris County and Galveston County Extension offices. And now there's a discussion about is there a JP court in, in that building? Does, is, it, is it lawful or not? That's the discussion for another interview. But there, I would send it to county commissioner's court. Or let's say there's a county park that has a 36 sign up. Then I would send it to the county commissioners. I'd probably send a copy to all of them. You could send it to the county judge. You just have to find out who the who's the top dog, so to speak, for that particular agency. And sometimes that's not as clear as it is with cities and towns. Mm-hmm. Well, the uh, you actually took care of my next question in regards to how to deal with the county. So I'm uh, that that's good. the uh, The next thing I want uh, I want to touch on is. And you've touched on this already, but I want to go back and just kind of make sure people understand this. When someone sees this and they're not entirely sure as to how to go about, you know, how to go about, you know, the process, let's say, let's say they are, you know, they're not sure what kind of document you said you're going to have the affidavit, you know, posted online. And if they have any questions about that, who could they contact to ask for advice or anything like that? Well, to the extent I'm available, I'll be happy to visit with folks, but quite frankly, with the, with the uh, number of, of signs that are up, I'm not sure I can field, field all the calls. <laughs> uh, but they can contact me. Uh, my law office number, even though I am I am retiring from, from the uh, public law practice, I will continue to handle uh, cases dealing with uh, sports shooting ranges and, and some Second Amendment issues. And frankly, uh, I'll be doing quite a bit of work on, on implementation of Senate Bill 273. But uh, they could contact my uh, my law office uh, phone number, which is 713-228-0700. But again, it's, my availability there is going to be very, very sporadic. Uh, the best thing to do and I will have this up before September 1, which is right around the corner. <laughs> uh, the best thing to do would be go to the TexasFirearmsCoalition.com website, and there will be a link for 30 out 6 and it will explain the process um, for, for making a complaint. It will have suggested steps, uh, which will include the, the three-day notice to um, – uh, government officials before you actually file a complaint. It'll talk about, uh, basically, it's going to be take a photograph that, that dates it and have the affidavit. And they can download the affidavit, plug in uh, from, my, from from the uh, TFC, Texas Firearms Coalition website, and then just fill in the, the, the blank. Um, that should do it. I'm going to have it out there both as a PDF and probably, and not 100% sure, but probably as a Word document, 
so that if with a Word document, they could just type in their name, sign the thing in front of a notary, and and then send it to uh, the AG's office. And the the affidavit will take care of both the initial notice, that is, not not to be sent to the government agency, but it will say to the AG basically, I gave notice on X date, on Y date, it was still up there. Here's a photograph on X date. Here's a photograph on Y date. I'm filing my complaint. So all of that will be available, and all of that will be explained. All righty. And I guess the final question I'd like to ask is, uh, and we've kind of touched on it a little bit, but where can we expect to see this legislation expanded in the future? The only thing that I anticipate at this point will be a, a private cause of action, and I want to address this uh, three-day notice period or three-day cure period prior to filing the formal complaint with the AG. And here's my concern. Um, there was a, I don't remember the gentleman's name, but there was someone who testified, uh, I don't remember if he actually came out against the bill, but it's clear that they were, but they their professed worry was, okay, we want a chance to cure this before uh, it ever gets to a complaint stage. And unfortunately, there was a senator who was sympathetic to that. And she, you know, I won't go any more than that. She was sympathetic to that. Uh, I think it was a bogus argument, but then obviously I'm biased. My concern is, and and the, the 30 out 6 sign that pops up in discussions more often than anything else are 30 out 6 signs at gun shows that are held in public owned property, city or county owned property. And the concern that I've got and other people have expressed is that, okay, gun shows, they set up Friday night, it's open Saturday and Sunday, and they close down Sunday. So you see the sign on Friday, you give, you give them notice on Friday, you got to give them three days. That's Monday. So the sign is down, and you can't file a complaint because the sign's down. I think, number one, that that three-day notice was unnecessary, and I argued that that we we needn't do we needn't make this amendment because all you got to they know it you know they should be doing their job they should be finding out is this lawful or not and if it's not don't put it up to me that's kind of like i can't be charged with assault until after i hit the guy the third time you know give me a break i know before i punch him the first time that that's that's unlawful but that argument fell on deaf ears so with that i would expect i would i would hope to see a change such that you get that three-day notice only once, only once. If you've had three days notice for a sign in that location before, then you don't get that, that that removes the duty to provide three-day notice on a first offense. And by the way, that three-day notice, I, uh, I think applies on the first offense, but frankly, I'd have to look back at 273. Uh, I take that back. I, I don't think that's the case. I may have to, I may have to punch it up in a minute and find out. There is a doctrine that deals with that, a legal doctrine, and it's called capable of repetition but avoiding review. And that applies when a lawsuit is filed. Let's say I sue the state of Texas on a constitutional ground, and it has to do with my age. And bad example because we tried this once and it failed. But let's say let's say I'm I'm 18 years old, and I uh, I sue the state of Texas because I can't get a CHL until uh, I'm 21. And then while the lawsuit is impending, let's say I'm 20, not 18, and while I'm you know, during the pendency of the lawsuit, I my, I have a birthday and I'm no longer 20, I'm 21. Now the state of Texas moves to dismiss the case as being moot because now. State law doesn't prohibit me from getting a CHL because I'm 21. The suit, the suit could go on, and it could go on because I'm attacking the system, and the system could do something unconstitutional but avoid review. Why? Because it takes longer to get to court than the, uh, the, the duration of the prohibition. The problem with that in this particular setting is that works when you have a lawsuit going. We can try to stretch it to say no. We still have the right to file suit, but that's, you know, that's problematic because you file you you file a complaint with the AG's office and say, okay, City of Houston does this 
on George R. Brown uh, Convention Center four times a year for every gun show. We file the notice. Come Monday morning, the sign's down. I can't file a complaint, so I'm filing it with the AG's office anyway. So the AG investigates. They have to give 15 days to cure the problem. So here we are again. Now, I will say this. The 15 days to cure uh, to cure uh, is a first offense deal for the AG's office. And that I'm should be fully cognizant of, but uh, I need to read that one again, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. And that may be something that would help them on on multiple offenses, but until you have a court awarding uh, a judgment against the entity, it's still a first offense. All right. Well, I'm, I want to throw this out there. I think, I think the uh, repetitive offense like the gun shows really does need to be addressed because I have a sneaking suspicion you'll have somebody, they'll get notice, they'll take it down, they'll document it being taken down, and then a week or two later they'll throw it back up. And I, I think they'll try to game the system using that, and I see this as a potential abuse of the system. Oh, I, you're, you're absolutely right. And with gun shows particularly, uh, and to a lesser degree other, other events on, on the government property, uh, but certainly with gun shows, a lot of the times the gun show promoters the one actually putting up the sign, and they're doing it because insurance requirements, uh, and that's that's a potential problem. I know a lot of gun owners really get upset when they see a thirty out six sign at a gun show on on government owned property. It's really not that the gun show promoter has any choice. Um, if they're going to get insurance, they're going to have to pro- prohibit guns now. Does it have to be 30 out 6? Could it be a generic sign that has no impact on CHL holders? Sure, it could. But that's where the problem comes in. But you're you're right. We're going to see that happen. Uh, we're we're going to we're we're going to see signs coming up and down. It's gonna you know it's gonna be a yo-yo, and that's why I think we need to address that, and I think we need to add uh, a private cause of action. And what I mean by that, for shouldn't use lawyer terminology here. What that would, the way I would envision that provision, it would say that if you know once the complaint's been filed, the AG has to investigate. They have to give them 15 days to to cure the the uh, the violation. And if in fact, if in fact, the AG's office does not file suit within X days, pick your number, 15 days, 30 days. You know, I don't want to make it 90 days, but you know, some some number there that any citizen, any CHL holder in the state of Texas would be allowed to file suit. And you'd have to say CHL holder because they would be the only ones with standing. And that would allow them to go forth, file a suit, and if they win, which they would, then they too could collect reasonable and necessary attorney fees and all the other cost of litigation. Well, I appreciate all that. Anything you want to say before we wrap the interview up and anything that you feel like uh, you need to get out before we close down the show? Uh, no, I appreciate the offer uh, to, to get these issues before gun owners. I, I think it's uh, both of them are very important. Um, while we were sitting here, I did punch up uh, this uh, the bill, and I, it was correct that uh, the 15-day period to cure by the AG's office applies only <clears throat> on the first offense. But again, everything is a first offense until a court pops uh, a city uh agency or entity, I'm sorry, a government agency or entity with a fine. So, yeah, once they've been fined, they don't get the notice period anymore, but uh, that can happen many times before it actually gets there. Well, uh, I appreciate you being on the show, and if there's anything I can do for you in the future with the podcast, let me know, and uh, I want to give you the last word. I appreciate it, Aaron, and I appreciate what you do with the podcast. Uh, You know, podcasts are a very important method of getting the information out. Uh, I must admit that until oh, very relatively recently, I had no idea what what a large uh, audience podcasters have. And uh, it's a great way to get, get the information out. No longer do the big three media uh, have the ability to control the message. And for everything that you do, uh, I certainly appreciate it and uh, offer you my thanks. Now, the thing about that particular interview, I want to say that if you want more help, than what we discussed in there, feel free to go to texasCHLforum.com. That's the forum that's run and administered by Charles Cotton. Go to that forum, check out everything that's on it, and you'll be amazed at some of the things you're going to find there. With that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. 
and then, yes, and then we'll hit the news and wrap up the show. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, we got our typical three news story lineup for you again. This time, we're going to touch on one article that, well... It's part of the inter- uh, part of the subject of the interview, and then we're going to have a story about open carry advocates, and then we'll have a story that's been in national news. So let's kick it off with the political story. Improper postings by government subdivisions have plagued CHL holders since the beginning. If you listen to the interview at, in the middle of the show, you already know that, though. September 1st, these improper postings will no longer be something we simply have to accept thanks to legislation that goes into effect on September 1st of 2015. September 1st is just a few days away, so get ready, folks. I just included that so people could have a link in the show notes to a news article that ties into the interview. Our next story is a litigation alert. A number of open carry advocates have filed a lawsuit over their arrest at the state capitol. Now, they were arrested for, among other things, carrying long guns, black powder replicas, and toy firearms. The arrest was because they were carrying these on state capitol grounds. I'm not sure exactly why that's a major issue in the in there. I think more research is needed before I could actually make a good comment. I've discussed it before, but it's been a while, and I don't want to comment on this without knowing more. Anyhow... C.J. Grisham, Terry Holcomb, both of which have been on the show, Justin Delosh, and other plaintiffs are, or others are plaintiffs in this lawsuit. In the case of C.J. Grisham, one might actually wonder if this is a potential conflict with his efforts to run for a Senate seat as far as a conflict, as far as it being a conflict for his time. Then again, it may just be an effort for him to draw attention to himself, get his name out there. I mean, the timing of this is kind of suspect, but beyond that, We'll see how this actually goes. In our final story, the deceased shooting suspect in the on-air shooting of a TV news crew actually has ties to the West Texas community of Midland. He worked at the Midland TV station KMID for a short time in the 1990s, and he appears to have been generally well-liked. Station personnel have not found any documents bearing either name used by the suspect, but that could have changed since the time the article was published and I read it. With that said, there's a link in the story. You know, there's a link in the show notes, and this article is about an event that happened out of state with in-state ties. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We have a great interview for you, and I'm not, I'm not going to waste any more time here. I'm going to go ahead, wrap up the show, and after this, we'll come back. I'll do a little bit of a after-show comment, and then in the show. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Now, this episode was recorded on Friday, August 28th of 2015. I'm planning to release this episode probably uh, midnight Sunday morning for everybody that's interested in getting getting more information about what's been going on. Let me say that I have had a lot of different irons in the fire between work and various other things I have going on. As a result, I took a lot of time off. I mentioned that in the last episode. Before that, the episodes that aired were not of the quality I was, I'm very proud of. And to make it up to the audience, I'm going to ask you to let me know what you want to hear about. Let me know what you want this podcast to cover. If you got somebody you want this podcast to interview, let me know. That's all there is to it. 
On that note, please stay safe and carry responsibly.